In 2019, uh, it's, it's our desire as a church to fall into the word of God together, to fall into the word of God more deeply. How many of us want to be more uh, attuned to the Holy Spirit in our lives, more aware and alert of God's work in our lives? And, uh, and here's a secret that I want to give you just right from the beginning this morning is if you want a deeper, more intimate relationship with God, with Jesus, then there's no better way of doing that than to familiarize yourself with the living word of God, the living word of God. The living word of God is sharper than a double-edged sword. What does that mean? That means that if there's anything that is a barrier, uh, if you can imagine with me uh, a rainforest or the Amazon and how thick the vine is and it could be really difficult, you might only be about 100 feet away from someone, but it could take you hours to get there because of everything that's in between. And I want you to imagine that the living word of God, whatever it is that's between you and God, the living word of God comes in like a double-edged sword and cuts down down anything so that there's no longer that barrier or that space between you and God. So even this morning, I want to encourage you as we get ready to dive in, we're going to really take a look, a deep look at a, a passage that talks about this living word out of 1 Peter. So if you want to go ahead and start turning there, you have your Bibles with you, you have your phone or your iPad or whatever it is, uh, your tablet, you can pull that out and start making your way there. But even as you're turning to 1 Peter this morning, I simply want to ask you this question so that you can be thinking about this as we together think about what it means for us to dive into the living word uh, this year, to dive into that place where we are hearing from God in a deeper way, okay? And so what I want to ask you right now is, what are the things that are causing you, what are the things that are, that are causing you to not be able to hear the word of God clearly in your life right now? What are those things that are, that are muffling? I mean, they're like earmuffs and God's trying to speak to you. It's kind of like, I don't know, these days we got, uh, uh, we got devices and, and we have Bluetooth technology and we have all these different kind of headphones and there's earphones now that people wear that you can't even tell they're wearing earphones, right? They're just like invisible, you know? So then it, it kind of makes it, you know, it, it kind of contributes to that whole uh, 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 situation that's taking place where we have a hard time as a society communicating to one another, right? I was standing at a crosswalk the other day. I was like, hey, what's going on, man? How you doing? He just kept looking straight forward. I was like, all right, fine then. <laughs> and then I realized that he had earbuds in, right? He had earbuds. So he wasn't really trying to be a jerk or like tune me out. He just couldn't hear me, right? It wasn't that he was trying not to hear me. He just couldn't hear me. Why? Because, you know, had music on and the music was loud and couldn't hear my voice, right? And so we think about that in our lives, in our, our lifestyles, what are those things that are in our spiritual ears that are causing us to not be able to hear the voice of God, the word of God in our lives? Sometimes that's sin, right? Sometimes it's something that we're a, a lifestyle or behavior or habits that we are currently uh, doing. And, and it's those things that are causing us to not be able to hear God because we are not attuned to God. We're not attuned to the voice of God. We're tuned to something else. We're tuned to that sin. And what do we do whenever we are, we are really uh, enjoying that sin, whatever that might be, whether that be, you know, a substance that we're enjoying uh, too much, whether that be uh, 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 involved in a lifestyle, whether that be, you know, getting involved sexually in ways that we shouldn't be or, or allowing our eyes to go to places where they shouldn't be going or, or our minds to wander or drift into places where they shouldn't go, whatever it is that's there, maybe it's, maybe it's uh, envy, maybe it's uh, pride, whatever, whatever that, that sin thing is, what happens is we as humans, as fallen humans, start to tune our ear to that thing. And then guess what happens? We get to hear that more clearly. It's like the radio, right? You know, the, the little radio, the, the transistor radio or different kind of radio. My dad has one in the garage that uh, doesn't have buttons. It just has the, the dial knob. And so if you really want to hear something really well, you kind of got to like go back and forth a few times before finally you get it right to that perfect point where the scratchiness isn't there and now it's clear. You see, so in our lives, oftentimes what ends up happening is, is we, we say we want to be tuned into the living word of God, but we end up tuning ourselves by virtue of our habits, our disciplines, our focus, our, our attention. We end up tuning ourselves to a different station. And so, so God's word is being transmitted, but we're not even hearing it. We're hearing, you know, something else. 
So our, our vision and our hope and desire as we get ready for 2019 to, to commit to the living word, to being invested into falling into the living word, to, to diving into the living word together is that we want to first move ourselves away from being tuned into channels that we shouldn't be on and start to tune ourselves into the channel that God wants us on, right? Um, and, and as hard as it is, as, challenges, as challenging as it is, that's where we want to be. Somebody say amen. amen. Right? We want to be right there, tuned in, dialed in, so that we could hear the voice of God. We could hear the word of God speaking into us, calling us, right? It's a beautiful voice. Somebody say it's a beautiful voice. Beautiful right? Oftentimes we're a little bit nervous. We're afraid of the voice of God. Why? Because the voice of God brings truth, and we don't always want to hear the truth. Somebody say amen. Right? We'd rather hear other things that make us feel good. We'd rather hear other things that, uh, that, that, that reinforce our lifestyle. Well, when the word of God comes and brings truth, that's a little challenging, but I want to let you know, not only is it something that we, we shouldn't be afraid of, but it's something that's beautiful because it's calling us into a new walk with Jesus, a new lifestyle, a new awareness of God, a new ability to, to walk with the Holy Spirit and for the Holy Spirit to just be able in the, in the middle of the day, be able to speak into our lives and say, hey, this is where I want you. This is where I need you. This is what I'm doing in you. Get ready because this is what I want to do in this year. We want to come to a place where that becomes so clear in our lives and not just muffled and, and something that faintly we can kind of hear, which if we're honest with ourselves is probably the case most of the time, right? We, because we have so many different messages that are coming in. So as we get ready to talk about the living word, it's important for us to think about the uh, contrary to that, which is a dying word, a dying word, right? Let me give you an example of a dying word. Uh, how many of you got up this morning and, uh, Took a look at the news in one, one form or another. Anybody like to look at the news, what's going on, what's happening, right? Maybe you picked up your newspaper on your uh, driveway, looked at the couple headlines that were on the front, saw that unfortunate thing that happened over at Gable House in Torrance, terrible, right? Um, or, or whether you open it up on your phone and, and you look at your news. I tend to look at most of my news on my phone uh, just because it's more convenient for me or my, my laptop. Um, but whatever it is, however it is that you get your news, Okay, uh, more likely than not, after about a day, what is it? It's, it's not even news anymore. It's like olds. I don't know if that's a word, but it's not news anymore because it's outdated. And something else comes in because it's got to bring something that's newer, right? And oftentimes, if we're just looking at news, whether it be on uh, TV, whether it be in a newspaper, online, whatever it may be, right? It's not always something that's going to be life-giving to us. In fact, uh, you know, uh, it, it, the news shouldn't even have a, like, a, like a rating, like PG-13, rated R, or whatever. But it's like, I'll let my kids watch stuff that's like PG-13, and I won't let them watch the news. Because all of a sudden, my kids are watching it. Next thing you know, my son's asking me questions. Daddy, what's suicide? Daddy, what's this? Daddy, why did they do that? And I'm like, change the channel. Because this is not life-giving to me or my family, Right? And it's connected to this other human impulse that we have to constantly be driven to, uh, to, to be obsessed with the negative, which as people of faith isn't something that we should be committed to. Amen? So the living word, somebody say living word. The living word. It's living and it's life-giving. Living word is living and it's life-giving. So if you're with me there now to 1 Peter, uh, we're looking at 1 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to look at this wonderful passage that is, that is um, going through this, uh, this topic that we're, we're looking at called the, the living word, the living word. And uh, it's our goal for this year. I don't know if you're excited about this. I am uh, on Sunday mornings to work our way through the Bible. Um, so we're going to work our way all the way through the Bible, and uh, we'll kick it off this week by talking about the, the power of the living word in our lives. Are you excited about going through the Bible, church? All right. So here we are, uh, starting in uh, verse 1 of chapter 1. It says this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And by the way, church, let me just stop you right here and just say, if you are doing your own personal devotion and you can't figure out how to pronounce most of these places, don't worry about it. That doesn't make you a bad Christian, right? It's okay. All right. 
Because I always like to make fun of people that like try to correct the way you pronounce something. I'm like, bottom line is, that's an English translation of an original Greek place. So you're not even saying it right. Anyway, so don't worry. Don't, don't be caught up on that, okay? It's all right. Okay, um, so here we go. Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Man, that is a mouthful of an introduction by our brother Peter. Okay, so here he is and he's writing. And I want us to take a few notes of a couple things that we see here. Peter is an apostle of Jesus and he's writing to God's elect. Somebody say elect. Elect. Now, uh, elect is also a word, and we'll see it used again here in chapter 1, that refers to chosenness. So if you're part of the elect and chosenness, that means there's something special about you. You are elected as, as opposed to some who have not been elected. Doesn't it feel good to be chosen, church? Right? Doesn't it feel good to be chosen? I, I can remember being chosen um, by going and playing with my brothers and being the youngest, and, and we would go play ball, and every once in a while, I'd be nervous that I was the youngest, and they were going to choose everybody, and I'd be like the default guy, or like the add-on. It's seven on seven. Oh, you guys can have Koba, too. You know what I mean? Like, oh, thanks. Appreciate that. Right? Don't feel very chosen. Don't feel very elected. Right? Kind of feel left out and feel like, you know, it doesn't really matter where I land. Um, but Peter's writing to the church, and he says, you are the elect. You are chosen. And so I want to extend that to you as part of the church that the word of God extends to and simply say, be reminded, church, that you are part of God's chosen people. So turn to somebody next to you and tell them you are chosen. You are chosen, right? You are chosen. That means this. I want you to think about this. That means that that God, for one reason or another, many of us in here are like, man, I still can't figure out the reason why. God has chosen you to be an ambassador and a representative of Jesus Christ, and that's why he chose to meet you where you were and to bring you from your sin into a new life in Jesus. And there was something about you that he saw that he wanted to do that work in. There was something about you. Some of you are like, man, I don't know what it is that God saw in me because I was this, that, and the other. I was cantankerous. I was angry. I was bitter. I was hopeless, right? I'm not very gifted. I'm not very talented. I don't have much to show for. I don't have a lot of achievements or accolades. What is it that that qualified me for God to choose me? And what I want to say is this. You may know right now. You may never know. Bottom line is Jesus saw something in you that he wanted to use for his glory and his name. And so he chose you specifically for a purpose. Isn't that kind of cool? Just to start off, right? Just to start off with this truth that you are chosen. And you're not an accident, right? You didn't just say, oh, man, no, I didn't get chosen. I was just born into a Christian family, and that's why I'm part of this thing. What I would say is, no, that's not true at all. I'm born into a pastor's family, but there are moments when when the Holy Spirit reveals to me, and, and, and God says, this is why I chose you right? This is why I have you here. Uh, I had a meeting with uh, the president of the university where I work. And, uh, and so I was kind of like, you know, feeling a little bit anxious about this meeting. I didn't know what we were supposed to be meeting about, right? Because I don't, I don't know how many of you get a little bit nervous when you're around somebody who's got like a lot of authority, okay? So, for, so you would be like, Pastor Koba, no way you would. And I'm like, yeah, for real, I am. Every time, I don't know why. I'm around the president. I'm like, oh man, I feel like I'm in fifth grade again. Like, <laughs> You know, I feel like my mom just licked her hand and wiped my hair and, you know, I'm, I'm all like checking, make sure my, my zipper's up and, you know, my shoes are tied and all this kind of stuff. And the president's talking with me and, uh, and all of a sudden he says, have you thought of why you are here at this university? And I was like, well, you know, I need money to pay, you know, pay for my family's uh, <laughs> bills and everything like that. And like, have you thought about why you're here? And I'm like, well, you know, I, I transferred here. I graduated from here. No, have you thought about why you're here? Uh, well, I, you know, I love ministry. And then after about four years, figured out I love college ministry. No, have you thought about why you are here? A half Mexican and half Caucasian American young man, right, who's able to be in both worlds at a university in close to East Los Angeles where our demographics have shifted to now we are a majority minority institution, meaning that we have more students of color than we have white students for the first time in the history of this institution since 1899. Have you ever thought about why you are here for such a time as this? All of a sudden I just started crying. (laughs) Right? I'm like, oh man, okay, you got me. One of those things where the Holy Spirit's like, I have chosen you, right? A kid from Carson, right, to come and make an impact in this place because of the fact that you have one foot here and one foot there. I've set you apart, 
right? That wasn't a plan that my parents had back in 1984, or it would have been 83, because in 84, never mind, nine months, you know what I'm talking about, junior church, by the way, just a little plug, we tend to talk about mature topics. Anyway, so I'm in that moment, and I'm realizing, man, God, you have selected me, you have chosen me, that's something special. Peter is writing to the church and says, church, you have been chosen. You are the elect. You're part of God's plan. Isn't that cool? Right? It kind of reminds me of those superhero movies too, right? Like the Avengers, where all of a sudden they, they, they realize like, man, the enemy that we're facing is too big for any one of us superheroes to, to attack. But if we put together a team like Iron Man and Captain America and Thor and Hulk, and if we all get together, maybe we can attack this larger enemy that we have. And they go around and it's just like these cool sequence of scenes where they're like plucking one person from the lifestyle that they went back to. And all of a sudden they realize that there's something that they have that the team needs in order to get the job done. That's what it's like why God chose you. It's just something that you have that God needs to get the job done. Okay? And so you're chosen. You're elect. And you're, you're called out. It says to God's elect and to strangers in the world. Another word for strangers is exiles or foreigners. And so as we think, it's not stranger like, you know, the way your parents taught you not to talk to strangers. It's more of a stranger uh, from, this, from the meaning of somebody who is not from here. Everybody with me so far? So an immigrant or a foreigner, right? That's more of like the exile terminology that's being used here. So it's essentially saying here, you are exile uh, and you are, it says, scattered throughout the provinces, sprinkled throughout the provinces. So Peter now is going, so first of all, you're elect, you're chosen, there's something about you. Secondly, you have been intentionally scattered to where you are. In other words, Peter's saying, you are where you are on purpose. Many of us uh, question that and say, God, why do you have me here? Why do you have me in this line of work? Why do you have me in this neighborhood? Right, all of these different kind of things, and you are where you are on purpose. So Peter's telling them, you're not just exiles because of a political thing that took place and all of a sudden you had to relocate. You're not just exiles because you were Jews in Jerusalem and there was the persecution that took place and people had to leave. No, you're not just exiles because of these situations. God actually had it as part of his plan for you to be exactly where you are. So it's kind of cool because Peter is putting a positive twist on an otherwise negative situation. Let me say it one more time. Peter is putting a positive twist on an otherwise negative situation, right? Because otherwise, they would be thinking to themselves to be in exile simply means you're no longer welcome where you used to be. And how many of us know that whenever something happens to us in life, we can either dwell on it from the negative standpoint and hang our heads down and feel bad about all the things that could be, should be, would have been that are no longer possible. Or we could say, all right, God, here I am. What, what next, Lord? God, I can't change what has taken place. 2018 already happened. I don't get to have the rewind button on 2018. All I get to do is simply say, here we go, 2019. Lord, you have me right here. Maybe this could have happened, maybe that would have happened, and I would have been here, there, or the other, but I ain't, and here I am, so Lord, what next? Amen? And, and I want you to know that if we surrender our, our, our plans to God in that way and simply say, Lord, I'm, I'm available to you, and I'm ready to see what you want to do with my current situation, I guarantee you 100% of the time, the Holy Spirit will be faithful and will come through and will say, this is exactly why you are right here, and this is exactly what I want to do using you in this coming year. Right? Rather than spending six months out of the year and then all of a sudden in June we're, we, we, we realize that we wasted our time, shoulda, coulda, woulda, right? Instead of simply saying, Lord, in this first week of January, here I am. I'm right here. I ain't nowhere else. I could have been other places, but I, that didn't happen and here I am. And now, God, what is it that you want to do? What is it that you want to do? So Peter's telling them you're chosen and you're right there where you are on purpose. Everybody with me so far? And it says, your exiles, you're scattered. This one says strangers. Later on, we're going to see foreigners or immigrant. Okay, we're going to get to that in just a little while. I'm not going to dive into that just yet. It says, you're scattered throughout all these different provinces. Um, and then it goes into verse 2. It says, um, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit to be obedient to Jesus, sprinkled with his blood. Now, there's three words in here that I want us to pay attention to. Uh, the first one is sanctified. Uh, sanctifying work. Somebody say sanctifying work. Then it says obedient to Jesus. Somebody say obedient. obedient. And then somebody say sprinkle with his blood. So the first one is this, sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? To be sanctified means to be made holy, 
To be made holy, to be made uh, sanctified is to be made holy. In other words, I love the fact that it says sanctifying work. How many of us know that we aren't where we uh, are ultimately going to be? We are in process. Okay. Uh, hopefully we are going to be further along than we were last year, but not as far as we will be in 2020 if God uh, will give us that year. Right. So the sanctifying work means we are on a journey, we are on a process, and the Holy Spirit is at work. Imagine that you had a sign on your back that says, right, work in progress, right? Or, or, uh, or uh, what is the word that you see in a construction site? Uh, you know, uh, please don't uh, pardon our dust or something like that, right? What does that mean? God is at work on me. I'm not a final product just yet. I think that's exciting. I don't know about you. I think that's exciting. See, oftentimes as Christians, we end up holding ourselves back from the transformation process because rather than seeing ourselves as a work in progress, we judge ourselves by what we're not yet. So we say, oh man, I should have been here, but I'm not there, and therefore, and all of it, and then we feel bad about ourselves because of what we said or did or the habit that we still have that we thought we shouldn't have anymore, and we start to judge ourselves by not being where we thought we should be rather than simply saying, I am a work in progress. So what does that mean? A work in progress means all we need to do is make sure we are going in the right direction. Okay, we're going in the right direction. And if we just focus on that, we're less likely to get bummed or depressed or, or, or we're, like, we're less likely to, to be upset about the fact that we're not where we thought we should be just yet. Everybody with me so far? Right. It's like uh, my son, you know, I'm teaching him how to skateboard. And, uh, you know, and so every once in a while, just to give him an example of like, you know, hey, if you practice, I'll do a little trick and pray that I don't like break something, you know, because I'm not as small as I used to be when I was a skateboarder. Um, um, but I'll but I'll do something. And then all of a sudden it'll inspire him and he'll say, whoa, 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 how do I do that? And then he'll just run and try to jump on the board to do it. And I'm like, wait, 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 you can't do that. Skateboard doesn't work like that. You got to get on it slowly. You got to figure things out little by little, one step at a time. And you keep doing that. And daddy, how do I learn how to do that? Well, first you got to learn this step. And then tomorrow we'll work on this one. The day after that, we'll work on that one. And if you keep getting that, then down the road, you might be able to get to this point. How many of us know that as believers, all of a sudden, we, we, we try to judge ourselves that we need to be at this point, when in reality, we just need to take one step at a time in order for us to get there. And that involves pr scripture, prayer, that involves habits, that involves friendships, relationships, that involves conversations that we need to be committed to this developing work. So first of all, it says sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. Sanctifying work simply means God is making us holy in the process of making us holy. And this is an important thing because we have this interesting predicament as uh, those of us who are, you know, as, as uh, the gospel of John puts it, in the world, but not of the world. Right? We are here, we're located here, we're, we're, we're embodied beings living on earth during this time, and so we are completely surrounded by this reality, right? So we're in the world, but then because we've been bought by the, by the blood of the Lamb, and because our sins have been forgiven, because our sights are no longer set on earthly things, but on things above, then all of a sudden we realize that we're not just in the world, uh, but and we are also not of the world. That means we belong to a different world. And the world that we belong to is not of this place. And so the sanctifying process is important. The sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit is this process that says, I am going to come into your life and I, little by little, I'm going to pull you away from the things of this world and start to orient you to the things of God's kingdom. Okay, so that means your wants, your values, your desires, uh, the way that you interpret hardship and struggle, the way that you look to tomorrow and the days after that, all of that needs to be covered in this sanctifying work process. That we are being made less and less of this world and more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ, being sanctified, being made holy. That also means our lives have to look different. Okay. Because oftentimes, uh, if, if you look at us, it, sometimes it's hard to differentiate between somebody who is walking in Christ and just somebody who hasn't even met Christ just yet, right? Look the same, dress the same, talk the same, do the same stuff, have the same ideas, visions, goals, desires, dreams, right? Behaviors, all these different kind of things. And we know that because we have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb, that we no longer want to look identical to this world. Amen? That when somebody looks at you, 
They look at me, right? I need, to, I need to look like Jesus, sound like Jesus, smell like Jesus, feel like Jesus. Does that make sense? Rather than simply say, oh, man, you know what? I'm never going to be like that, so therefore I'm just not even going to try. And so I'm not really into believing that uh, the Holy Spirit's got a sanctifying work in me. Instead of that mindset, we ought to say, Lord, make me more and more like you. Uh, Lord, I want that when people interact with me, all of a sudden they have a clear idea of who you are. Right? Or when people watch me from afar, they have a clear idea of who you are. That, that ought to be our dream, our desire, the sanctifying work. Right? It's a process, the Holy Spirit. So sanctifying work. Another one is obedient to Christ. Somebody say obedient. obedient. See, in the church today, in 28, 2019, excuse me, uh, we don't like the O word. You know? Well, that's a bad word. Obe oh, that's a bad word. We don't like the O word. Right? Because the O word presupposes that I can't do whatever I want. And that is a big problem today. Right? Because we live in the day and age of you get whatever you want, wherever you want, however you want it, as fast as you want, right? Uber Eats, okay? This is what I want. This is when I want it. And in fact, I want it to be delivered in a gray car <laughs> with a guy who has a beard, right? In less than 15 minutes. Or I want my money back and I'm writing a letter to everyone, right? I'm sending an email and it's going to be long. Oh, no, no, I'm giving you a bad Yelp review. Oh, we'll be there in five minutes, right? No, we live in the day and age of get whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want it, right? And so when we get to a passage like this that talks about obedience, we're like, uh-oh, the O word. And that's why I think it's important as we raise our children to teach them obedience, because if they can't learn how to be obedient to mom and dad, they'll never learn how to be obedient to Jesus Christ. Obedience, what does that mean? That means that when we hear God say something, we do it. But that presupposes that first we hear God say something. But most of the time we can't. And that's what we're talking about here, the living word, right? We have to unplug the ear plugs from all the other messages and things that are drowning us out. So that step one, we can hear God. Step two, we follow God. Okay, so obedience, so sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Uh, it goes on, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Verse three, praise be to God the Father, uh, uh, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Isn't that awesome? New birth and living hope. So Peter's talking about this new birth that we have. New birth and a living hope. How many of us are thankful for a new birth and living hope? Right? Being born again, it's an opportunity to, to no longer be committed or connected or stuck with all the different things of the past, mindsets of the past, a brand new birth. That means we are starting over in Jesus. And, and it says that we have this living hope and a new birth, which is a blessing uh, to us. I love the fact that when, you, when we really recognize that new birth and living hope reality in us, we can become very annoying to people of the world that don't understand faith. Because all of a sudden something happens and we're like, it's all good. Jesus is still king. Man, you crazy. How can you keep a smile on your face going, through, face going through something like that? It's because I have a new birth and a living hope. A living hope, right? Not a contingent hope, a conditional hope. We have a living hope in Jesus. No matter what's going on around us, we see, th see things the way that Jesus sees things. And as far as Jesus is concerned, if he's around, then there's victory there. Amen. Amen. So we live with this kind of like this, this underlying joy and confidence and peace that we have, right? That, that, that like Paul says, is a peace that surpasses understanding. It's a peace that doesn't make earthly sense. But we live with that peace. We live with that joy. And that's what drives us. And that's what causes people to think that we're crazy. Right? Like, man, how, do you, how are you living with that kind of strength right now? Because you should be like just completely broke down without any strength. And we say, it's because I got a new birth, I'm born again in Jesus, and I have a living hope within me that transcends anything that this world could possibly uh, destroy. Right? And I operate from that, and I pull that out. All of a sudden, we get tempted to be discouraged, and then we pull that out and say, Lord, give me that living hope. All right, there it is. And boom, we live in that, right? We're tempted to be, to be hopeless, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes in and says, remember, I gave you a living hope. Amen. I receive it, and then I live that out. We live from that living hope. And guess what? Not only do we live from that, but it's a gift that we get to bring to other people, whether they know Jesus or not. 
All of a sudden, that's what the thing that I think makes people ask questions. Whoa, that thing that you draw from, I want to know a little bit more about that because you've been delivering, you know, that fresh water to me, but I want to know where to get that water. And all of a sudden we say, okay, here, it's time. Why don't you come to church? Why don't you come here about who Jesus is? Why don't you give your life to Jesus so that you too can have that living hope? Amen. So, so then it goes into verse four and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. Now we're talking, Peter's getting, he's getting excited about, about this new message that you and I have an inheritance that could never perish, spoil or fade. So now he's using language that's referring to something that's bigger than the current reality. And here's why this is significant because the historical background of the churches that Peter's writing to is that they were all being persecuted right now during this time. They're being persecuted by the Roman government, uh, even worse than what we see happening during the time of Jesus in the Gospels. The, the church that Peter's writing to had major, they were the ones that were getting fed to lions. Uh, they were the ones that were uh, being skinned alive because of their faith in Jesus. They were the ones that were being burned. They were the ones that were being literally martyred, right, because of their faith. And so notice that in light of those circumstances, Peter's writing them and saying, you're chosen, Right? He's telling them you're chosen for a reason. He's telling them the Holy Spirit's working in you. And he's telling them that our inheritance is greater than anything this world can provide. Right? And we ought to really believe that. Because I think sometimes as Christians, we kind of believe that at a, at a, a very epidermal, like inch deep layer. But we got to believe that to our core, that what God is preparing and doing in us is something that goes deeper than this world. Right? And it's that reality of knowing that this inheritance is there and it doesn't perish, spoil, or fade. It's that reality that causes us to even dare to live a life that is sacrificial or selfless. Because if all we had was our eyes set on this thing, guess what? I would be so selfish. I wouldn't share nothing with nobody. I'd get as much as I could, do as much as I can. I'd have as much fun as I could, and then I'd die. That's how I would live if it weren't for this promise, right, that Peter's saying, your inheritance isn't even here, it's somewhere else. Therefore, it doesn't really matter what happens here. In fact, Paul says it in another place, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So I'm willing to serve, I'm willing to sacrifice, I'm willing to go out of my way to help somebody else out. Why? Because I know that my inheritance is somewhere else. Bank of America can't contain my inheritance, right? Can't. Why? Because it doesn't perish, spoil, or fade. And everything they have over there can and will. But what we have is something better, right? That's what gives Christians the ability to persevere in the midst of difficult circumstances because we know that our reward isn't even here. And Peter's reminding this church of these realities because they are, in fact, facing lots of suffering and persecution. So he's telling them, your inheritance is somewhere else. And then verse 5 says, who through faith you are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation. How many of us are thankful for being shielded by God's power in our life? Right? Isn't that a blessing? Um, and, uh, and so verse 6, in all this you, are, you uh, greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that, get ready for this, church, because many of us ask these questions, right? God, why is this happening to me? Lord, why am I going through this again? God, I thought you, 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 you fixed it last time, and now it looks like it got a little bit worse. What's going on here, God? Why am I in the midst of all these different things? And watch what verse 7 says. It says, these things have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith. How many of us want genuine faith? Man, I know I do. Right? I don't want no like, like half faith or hypocritical faith or any of that kind of faith. Man, I want genuine faith. And Peter says, the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold. How many of us believe the faith that, that God has given us is of greater worth than gold? Right? We're, we're comparing these things, earthly treasures versus heavenly treasures. Okay? Earthly value versus heavenly value. And Peter's saying, your faith, the genuineness of your faith, greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result, watch this, in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So let me give you a little trick. Are you ready for a little, uh, a little Christian hack real quick? Okay? A little discipleship hack is this, the genuineness of our faith, as Peter says, is gonna, be, is gonna result in uh, praise, uh, glory, and honor. So in other words, as we wanna develop the genuineness of our faith, then I encourage you to commit to praise, glory, and honor. 
In other words, praise Jesus all the time, right? In other words, give glory where glory is due, which is to God. Man, you do something good. Thank you, Lord. I give you all the glory because I wouldn't even be here if you didn't allow me to exist. Secondly, I wouldn't be here if you didn't come and save me from what I was living. Thirdly, I wouldn't be here if after I backslid, you came and you walked alongside me and walked me back into fellowship. Fourthly, fifthly, sixthly, I don't even know if you should say that. Anyway, all that to say is we are in this habit of giving and bringing glory to God. And in fact, we strive for even greater things so that Jesus can be even greater glorified. Amen? So we shoot high, we aim high, so that when we're there, for what we could do is say, first and foremost, I want to give all the glory and the honor to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave me health, who gave me life, who gave me redemption, who gives me constant reminder of his presence, who guides me, who, 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 who through the power of the Holy Spirit uh, allows me to know what is right and wrong and gives me wisdom in my life, who, who gives me humility when I'm tempted to be prideful. I want to give all the glory to God, right? And we give praise to Jesus and we wake up in the morning and say, Lord, I give you praise because today's a beautiful day and I get to enjoy it and I heard the birds chirping and man, this is a wonderful day to be a child of God. Lord, I give you praise. And, and we get in the habit of praise. We get in the habit of bringing glory. We get in the habit of honoring God. And guess what? That is the result of a genuine faith. So I'm giving you a little trick here. If you want to keep developing the genuine faith, then make it a habit to praise, to give glory, and to give honor to God. Daily, amen? All throughout the day. In fact, if things aren't going well, then I encourage you to make it a habit to give praise, glory, and honor to God. If things are going great, I, make, I, give you, I encourage you to make it a habit to give praise, glory, and honor to God. If things are going okay, so-so, all right, not great, not bad, then I'm, I encourage you to make it a habit to bring praise, glory, and honor to God. In fact, it doesn't matter what's happening, that once we're called to this new reality, this new birth and this living hope, then no matter what, in any situation or circumstance, we can give praise, glory, and honor to God. Now, now what we just went through in 1 Peter, that's the definition of spiritual maturity. The definition of spiritual immaturity is I give praise to God when things are going great and I curse God when things are going bad. That's the definition of spiritual immaturity. The definition of spiritual maturity is, God, I don't even have the answers to some questions that I have in my heart and in my mind, but glory to God anyway because I know you're good and your ways are not my ways. So I lift you up and I praise you, not because I should, but because I want to, because my heart is full nonetheless, no matter what, God. Even if tomorrow is worse, I'm still going to praise your name. Even if the day after that seems to get three times worse, I'm still going to praise your name because you have been good and you're worthy of praise regardless of what's happening in my life. How many of us know that's a great way to go before God in this coming year? Right? That gives us the ability to, to, to develop that deep spiritual maturity in our lives that's so different than what we see happening in the church today. So Peter's calling us into this place. It's genuine faith. Somebody say genuine faith. Well, we want that genuine faith, right? We don't want that, that fake stuff, right? That counterfeit stuff, fool's gold, right? We want genuine faith. We want, a, we want the trademark. We want the, the, the certificate of authenticity, on that faith. Amen? Um, so I, I'm going to, for the sake of time, because we have time and uh, we have communion today, I'm going to move to verse 13. It says this, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, okay, with minds that are alert and fully sober. So, so I want to make sure that we, I make this note. That both refers to um, making sure that we're not clouded by, uh, yes, it does refer to substance abuse, but it's not only referring to like, you know, that. It's referring to making sure that our minds are not clouded by other things that we can't focus on Jesus. And guess what? That can be substances and that can be other things, right? That can be uh, being on our phone 24-7. Right. Clicking from one video to the next or one thing to the next. And all of a sudden, a whole day went by and nothing productive happened. And your brain was so warped into that thing that you weren't able to even listen to or perceive the work of God around you. Right. So that's that's lack of sobriety there as well. Does that make sense? Um, so fully alert and sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Verse 14, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires that you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. Verse 17, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. 
Okay, I want, I, really quickly, I want to make a note on verse 17 that simply says this. Peter's saying, you ain't from here and don't get used to it here. Okay? P Peter says, don't unpack your suitcase. Right? I, I used to go on a lot of two-day trips playing sports. I know Pastor Traco probably did that like half, half his life when he was playing professional football. But you get to a certain city, right? And I never unpacked my bag. Right? I just kept it in the corner, nice and neat. I took out what I needed for the day, put what I didn't back in it. So that way when it was time to go, I just pick it up and go. I didn't start putting it in those drawers, moving the Gideon Bible out of the way, you know, getting all comfortable, you know, hanging up my... I never even used the hangers, Right? Why? Because I was nervous that I would lose my coat in that closet when I leave. I keep everything in one spot. I didn't get used to it because I was only there for a couple days, right? And, and the second thing is, not only did I didn't get used to staying in those hotels, but I knew that I only have like 36 hours here. And so based on that, I am going to, whenever I have like a 50-minute break or a 30-minute break, I'm going to explore as much as I can around this radius because I might not ever come back to this part of the country again. Right. So I made the most of it. So two points from Peter's note to the strangers and foreigners in this land is number one, don't get too used to it. Number two, make the most of it. So he's telling us you here. Right. As those who live in the South Bay, Los Angeles, California, United States of America, 2018, this world, whatever you want to say. OK, guess what? You belong. Your citizenship is somewhere else. And so you're only here temporarily. Don't get too comfortable. Don't get too used to it. Don't get too attached to it. But make the most of it. Does that make sense? Make the most of it. So in other words, Lord, why do you have me here? Why do you have me now? What is it that you want in my life in this current year? God, I'm open to that. I won't get too comfortable here because I know that my home is somewhere else, right? I know that you have another home prepared for me as Peter's telling them. Um, he says, for you know, in verse 18, that it, it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Jesus, Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. So your faith and hope are in God. Now this last part here is important for us. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. I love how everything we've been talking about so far leads us to this point. Okay. Because it's one thing to, 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 be, to live holy lifestyle. It's calling us to holy. The verse before just said, be holy because God is holy. So we have this holiness command and this holiness invitation to live a holy lifestyle, right? Not defiled, not profane, to live holy because God is holy. That means completely surrendering ourselves over to God and saying, Lord, live in me. And so not only do we have this command, but we have this command that says, love one another. But I love how Peter says it kind of twice because he says, love one another and, and do it deeply from the heart. Do it deeply from the heart. And verse 23 says, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. So in other words, the thing that gives you the ability to love that way is because the seed that's in you is imperishable, but it's imperishable. Love one another. For all people are like grass, all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Mm -hmm.